My assignment this morning is to speak to the issue of the necessity of being confessional. Why, why is it important? Why is it necessary for us to be confessional? Uh, do we have to be? Should we? Uh, most people aren't. So, so why are we? Uh, in fact, there are, are a lot of people who have uh, advised us, and when I say us, I mean African Christian University, who have advised us against being confessional. Uh, and, and they've advised us against it because most people aren't confessional. And when you're trying to raise funds, if you're confessional, then someone may be offended by your confession. So why have a confession if it could stop someone or block someone from giving to you? Or why have such an exclusive confession? Why not have one that is as broad as it could possibly be? And we've all seen these, haven't we? Um, these confessions. And, it's very popular uh, for churches to have a, a statement of belief on, on their website, right? And um, most confessions will fill a small booklet. The historic Reformed confessions will fill a small booklet. These confessions are about this big on a website. Um, and they say almost nothing. Um, the door is usually as wide open as it possibly can be. Um, and, and that's sort of the goal of that kind of confession. But when we talk about confessionalism, historic reform confessionalism, it is a lot more limiting than that. Um, and there's a reason for that. I'll start with this from Carl Truman. Uh, I've, I've uh, used this quote so many times that I almost know it off by heart, but I use it so much because it is so relevant to our discussion. In his book, The Creedal Imperative, and I, I cannot recommend this book enough, Carl Truman, The Creedal Imperative, I'll say it again, Carl Truman, The Creedal Imperative. You want this, you need this, go get this. Okay, It's not a very long book, uh, but it's incredibly useful. And if you come up and ask me for the title of the book afterwards, I won't tell you. Because <laughs> I've said it three times now. So if you come, then I know, I'm, I won't tell you. Some of you are sitting there, yeah, I'll get it from you afterwards. No. Nope. <laughs> yeah, I won't. No. Okay? All right, I might. Carl Truman, The Creedal Imperative. He writes, Christians are not divided between those who have creeds and confessions and those who don't. Rather, they are divided between those who have public creeds and confessions that are written down and exist as public documents subject to public scrutiny, evaluation, and critique, and those who have private creeds and confessions that are often improvised, unwritten, and thus not open to public scrutiny, not susceptible to evaluation, and critically and ironically, not therefore subject to testing by scripture to see whether they are true. Again, the world is not divided. The Christian world is not divided between confessional Christians and non-confessional Christians. All Christians have confessions. It's just that some of us have decided we are going to be open and public and clear about our confessions and say, here's our confession, you can scrutinize it, you can test it according to scripture, and other people who have a confession but claim that they don't, so that the confession cannot be tested. Because you and I both know that churches who don't have confession, no creed but Christ, no confession but the, the Bible is our confession, right? These people have confessions they're just not written, and they're not available to be scrutinized. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do when someone says, no creed but Christ, no confession but the Bible, you just look at them and you say, oh, so you're going to let the Jehovah's Witnesses in. Ah, no, 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 I didn't say that. Well, of course you did, because they agree with that. No creed but Christ, no confession but the Bible. Yes, but when they say Christ, they mean something different than what we mean. Oh, 
So what do you mean? Well, when we say Christ, we mean, now stop. Because what you get ready to give me is a confession. <coughs> huh? What you get ready to give me is a confession. You're getting ready to give me a summary of doctrine. What you're going to do is not begin at Genesis 1-1, start reading, and not finish until you end with the last verse in Revelation. Right? You're going to give me a succinct statement concerning what you believe by Jesus. No creed but Christ. So now you do have a creed because you're going to tell me what you mean about Jesus. Or I can say, so you're fine, Roman Catholics, Protestants, that Roman Catholics. No, 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 no. You, you, you know, yeah, but you say no creed but Christ, right? No confession but the Bible. Ah, but when we say Bible, we don't mean the same thing as Catholics mean when they say Bible. When we say Bible, we mean the 66 books of, ah, 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 stop. Because what you're giving me now is a confession. You said no creed but Christ. You said no confession with the Bible. But now all of a sudden you're defining for me what you mean when you say Bible. Do you, do you follow? You don't just start reading in Genesis 1-1 and keep reading until you finish the whole thing. You give me a summary of the doctrine to which you hold, which means you have a confession. Everybody has a confession. It's just some are open and public about it, and others are not. Some of us are honest, and some of us are dishonest. And again, those people who are being dishonest, I'm not saying that they're being intentionally deceptive. And we'll talk about some of the objections and where the objections come from and why people think that they're actually, um, that, that they're actually being more biblical by not having a confession. Um, they're wrong, uh, but we'll get to that in a moment. But where does this anti-confessionalism, anti-creedalism come from? Sam, Sam Waldron, in his book, uh, um, Modern Exposition of the Second London Baptist Confession, by the way, you need that. Sam Waldron, Modern Exposition of the 1689. Um, many of you might already have that. If you don't, uh, get a copy of that. So yes, that's two books. <laughs> two books. I'm going to leave here with a reading list. Amen? School of Theology, right? Uh, amen? All right. Um, Waldron writes, uh, Sally, and by the way, um, Waldron's book is incredibly important uh, for a number of reasons, not least of which, sometimes we, we have objections, and a number of people have raised objections with me about, uh, you know, the, the, the 1689, and they say, no, 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 I, I agree with 1689, I hold to the 1689, it's just, I don't necessarily believe this, or I don't necessarily believe that, and, and, at almost every juncture, unless the person is, um, you know, holding to a new covenant theology, which a lot of people do, they hold to new covenant theology, and then they'll have significant problems with the confession uh, because they're not 1689 people. So they want, on the one hand, to say, I'm 1689 confessional Reformed Baptist, and on the other hand, say, um, I actually hold to new covenant theology. Um, and New Covenant theology is incongruent and inconsistent with the 1689. You cannot hold, you cannot simultaneously hold to New Covenant theology and the 1689. Because New Covenant theology is, is a, it's a, it's a different fundamental uh, theological presupposition. Okay? Um, and if you don't know what that is, that's a whole other discussion for a whole other day, uh, we don't have time to do that. Another issue that people have is they're actually dispensational, right? So they hold to dispensational theology and then try to hold to the 68 and you can't, you can't do that. You can't get there from here. Those two things cannot and do not go together. And with both um, New Covenant theology and dispensational theology, the problems center around the law of God. Um, so, again, there are those people. Put those people over here aside. 
there are other people who are legitimately confessional Reformed Baptists, but they have problems with some of the issues in the 1689. And inevitably, every time I enter into these conversations with people, the problems center around trying to understand uh, 16th century language and contextualize it for us in the 21st century. And a lot of times, all it is um, is people not reading the confession in its historical context and failing to understand the way certain phrases or why certain phrases are used the way they are in the 1689. And so Waldron's book was incredibly helpful in terms of grasping the historical context of the confession. And inevitably, when I have the, we have those discussions with people, when I have those discussions with people, and we talk about the language in its historical context, they come away going, oh, yeah, I agree with that. Right? But it, 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 all it amounts to is not understanding that these people are writing uh, 16th century, we're reading it 21st century, and we have to contextualize the language. So, all right, uh, why are we so anti-credal? Listen to this from Walden. Sadly, we live in a non-credal, even an anti-credal age marked by existential relativism, anti-authoritarianism, historical and historical isolationism. Many professing Christians regard creeds and confessions as man-made traditions, the precepts of men, mere religious opinion. And don't we hear this? Yeah, that, that's man-made. No creed but Christ, no confession but the Bible. Your confession is man-made. Okay, uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Carl Truman, again, um, uh, can I recommend Truman's book on this enough? Uh, Truman goes a little further and he gives these seven foundational principles that cause us to devalue the past. And again, it is because of the prevalence of these things that it is absolutely necessary for us to be confessional. Seven things. One, science. Truman argues that science by its very nature assumes that the present is better than the past and that the future will be better than the present. We're better. And we're going to be even better as we make further scientific discoveries. Science causes this historical skepticism. Yes, we know things now that they did not know then, therefore we are better than them. And we start talking about creeds and confessions. If you bring that mindset, right, we, we, we know now better than they knew then. Um, therefore, let's move forward and not move back. Closely related to that is the idea of technology. The idea of technology, it does the same thing. It causes us to devalue the past. Um, I'm, I'm a Mac guy. Um, and so, you know, you, you'll see here, you know, I have my, my MacBook Air, and I have an iPhone, and, you know, the problem with being, you know, a technology person, especially, especially if you are an early adopter. You guys know that term, early adopter? Uh, a lot of people will sit back and they'll go, yeah, let them work the bugs out of that, you know. Let, let them let them perfect that. Maybe I'll get I'll get I'll get that one once it's the old one. The early adopter says, as soon as the next one comes out, you know who you are, <laughs> right? And then early adopters here. If you're an early adopter living here, right, that's problematic because oftentimes it takes a while for it to get to Zambia, right? But that's okay because you have Amazon and you have friends who go visit. I know you because you find out when my trips are, right? Hey, you go into the city, you go by once you go, hey, when's your next trip to the States? Okay, here's what I need you to do. I won't call any names. Those are the early adopters, right? The early adopters, I want the new thing as soon as it comes out and you have a drawer full of old iPhones because you keep going and getting the new, I, yes, the early adopter uh, has an attitude toward history that's not exactly favorable. We don't want the old thing, we want the new thing. Uh, closely related to that, consumerism. 
consumerism causes us to devalue the past. He talks about the disappearance of human nature. And what he's referring to here, when he talks about the disappearance of human nature, is the idea that we're becoming um, so isolated in our understanding. Uh, we don't see ourselves as part of a broader human nature. We see ourselves as part of a particular constituency. A and we don't see ourselves as part of this sort of shared humanity. And again, so what does that, a document that was written in the 17th century in England, have to do with us who live here now, today, in 21st century Africa or Zambia or wherever you come from? Words, mysticism, pragmatism will say more about this, uh, but I believe this one is, is chief uh, amongst the, the things that cause us to devalue the past. Uh, mysticism and pragmatism particularly. Um, then he talks about just anti-authoritarianism. We don't like uh, authority. That doesn't tend to be as much uh, of a problem in, in this context. Um, African traditional religion, uh, African traditional worldview uh, tends to value um, uh, authority and hierarchy a lot more than some other worldviews do. Uh, but yet, there is still um, an inkling of that, even here, especially among the younger generation. The younger generation that, that growing up on DSTV and, and the interwebs and everything else, right? Uh, adopting ideologies from the outside. And one of those ideologies being adopted from the outside is this anti-authoritarianism that, that, that questions everything and that just does not just assume that those who are older know better. And then finally, there's the fear of exclusion. This fear of exclusion is what I alluded to earlier. The individuals who argue that, ah, you know, you don't want to be so confessional because that's going to exclude people on the outside. You want to be as broad as you can. You want to be as welcoming as you can, uh, as opposed to being as clear as you can. Let me say a word about a couple of these things. Specifically, let me say a word about um, mysticism and subjectivism. The mysticism is the default position of the Christian in general. Um, it is also um, very familiar in terms of African traditional worldview and African traditional religion. Um, let me give you some some more technical definitions and then try to explain and make that point. This is from Charles Hodge in his Systematic Theology. Listen carefully, he wants to unpack this. And, 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 and you, you, just, you can give me this or this, all right, as to how particularly African this sounds. A mystic is one who claims to see or know what is hidden from other men. see some of these right here, right? Like, yeah, yeah it's, you know. Um, whether this knowledge be attained by immediate intuition or by inward revelation, in most cases, these methods were assumed to be identical, as intuition was held to be the immediate vision of God and of divine things. Immediate uh, um, vision of God and divine things. Hence, in the wide sense of the word, mystics are those who claim to be under the immediate guidance of God or His Spirit. Uh, or His Spirit. The immediate guidance. And when I say immediate, um, you have to realize that Hodge here is writing a systematic theology, so he's using this in the theological sense. Um, immediate. We use immediate as in immediately, right now. But immediate, okay. Take, take the root there. Mediate. In this sense, immediate means without mediation. There is no mediator. Okay? There is no mediator. So in that sense, the mystic believes that they need nothing to mediate between them and this 
knowledge or vision of God, not even his word, and especially not a confession. Okay? Now, I always use this illustration to help people understand how, how mystical we are. If you want to get church folks on the edge of their seat, okay, if you want them to sit up and say, ooh, it's about to happen now, this is what you do. You stand up and you say, you know, I, I had prepared my sermon for this morning, but I, I'm not going to preach that sermon. Uh, the Lord has just given me something else that I believe <laughs> is important. At that point, people are like, oh, get, uh, 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 this is, we're about to get the good stuff now, right? <laughs> Why? Because of mysticism, right? You see, we believe that when you go into your office and you crack your books and you're doing exegesis and all this other stuff, I mean, that's okay, that's fine. But the real stuff, the anointing, <laughs> that is what happens when you put your notes aside and just let the Lord loose. Yes. <laughs> right here, right now. <laughs> put the notes down, preacher, and just give us God. <laughs> That's pure mysticism. Pure mysticism. Think about what we communicate when we say that, right? The Spirit of God can't work with you in your study with your books open. He can't work with you with your notes. But when you close your books and get rid of your notes, you just open up the channel. It becomes immediate. There is no mediation. It's just the direct. Huh? If we're honest, some of us actually just, you know, maybe a little bit. <laughs> Again, but think about what we're saying. This is pure mysticism. Pure, pure mysticism. Again, applying the mind God gave you, right? With your books open, doing all your study, all this sort of stuff, that, you know, I mean, okay, yeah, okay fine, that's fine, that's good, I'm glad you do that, right? I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to say don't do that, right? But we all know that the real stuff is the stuff that doesn't use notes, doesn't use exegesis, doesn't rely on books and study or any of this. It just relies on the spirit. Closely related to mysticism is, is quietism or, or, or docetism. Listen to this from Graham Goldsworthy. The quietest docetic Christian is one who doesn't make any decisions because the Holy Spirit makes the decisions for it. Such a person is also likely to construct a docetic hermeneutic of Scripture. The human characteristics of the biblical documents are ignored. Historical and biblical theological contexts are regarded as irrelevant. If a text speaks to me in whatever way, then the careful exegesis of it is dismissed as cerebral intellectualism. So you say, the Lord showed me this, the Lord, I was reading, I was reading the scripture, I was reading this passage, and then the Lord just showed me. Never seen this before. The Lord, the Lord just showed this to me. And then somebody else comes behind you and says, well, um, actually, I'm not sure who showed you that, because if you understand this text in its historical and grammatical context, then this text can't actually mean what you say it means. Ah, you, I, I hear you come, putting God in the box. <laughs> do, do you know these people? Have you been these people? Right? 
Have you been these people? Trying to make a de- trying to make a decision in life, right? Come on, let's let's make a decision. Ah, no, no, I just want to, you know. And it's really hard for them to make a decision. Why? Why is it hard to make a decision? Well, because I want to make sure that it's the Lord and not just me. What does that even mean? What does that even mean? And and how do you how do you I mean do you just like open it up and go ah uh, that came from this side and I needed to come from a little bit more over how, how do you do that? How do you do that? The Bible talks to us about the decision making process, right? Right? The wisdom in a multitude of counselors counting the cost, cut right? The Bible talks to us about these things, right? No, 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 no. Uh uh-uh. uh. You know, trying to decide, trying to decide, you know, where, 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 where we're going to move, right? We have an opportunity in this country, and we have an opportunity in that country. We just don't know what we're going to do. And then all of a sudden, boom, there it is. Wait, what happened? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. I woke up this morning, no alarm, no nothing, sat straight up out of my bed, and it was 0347. Okay? No, you don't understand. One of the places that we were planning to move to, there's a flight on South African Airways that flies directly there. Do you know what flight number it is? <laughs> it's flight number 357. That was God! <laughs> and then you try to talk to these people and it's like, ah, there you go again, putting God in a box. I know this. Why else would this happen, right? Or you have a daily reading plan, right? And you're going through your daily Bible reading plan and there's something going on in your life. And all of a sudden today, you read something and there's a phrase in what you read. That's just like, there it is. There it is. What? Paul went to, you know, He, he went to Athens. Okay? Well, one of the places that we're considering is <laughs> to Greece. I had no idea what we were supposed to do. And then I'm agonizing over this and I open the Bible and my day they're reading and boom, there it is right there. <laughs> We laugh, but we all know people exactly like this. And then you start opening up the Bible, right? And they want nothing to do with it. People who are making decisions in their life about what to do. I mean, there can be things that are just completely unbiblical. Do not be yoked together with an unbeliever. Amen? Don't don't marry an unbeliever. I mean, it just you know that's that's kind of it's just kind of clear, right? Apparently not. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who are going down that road with somebody who's not a believer, and you open the scriptures, and it's just like <coughs> why. Well, because they know, because they, they've already sought the Lord on this. And the Lord has confirmed in their spirit that this is the one. What do you do with that? Listen to this from Jonathan Edwards. This error will defend and support errors. As long as a person has a notion that he is guided by immediate direction from heaven, it makes him incorrigible and impregnable in all his misconduct. For what signifies it for poor blind worms of the dust 
to go to argue with a man and endeavor to convince him and correct him that is guided by the immediate counsels and commands of the great Jehovah. Who are you? I'm telling you, the Lord told me this, right? And you're going to come with, right? You're going to come with, yes, I'm coming to you with scripture. Yes, but the Lord told me, okay? Do you see how this would not lend itself to someone being confessional? Amen? It, I mean, if I have this sort of immediate, right, vision of the divine and the holy, if I'm not even going to listen to, if I'm not, I mean, I'm not even going to listen to you when you quote book, chapter, and verse, why in the world would I listen to you when you quote a confession? Okay? So, I say all this to say that it is very much necessary that we have confessions. Um, by the way, what is our finished time here? 11 is our finished time. Okay, all right. So let's talk about the legitimacy of confessions. There's a couple of arguments against the legitimacy of confessions, a couple of main arguments. I've alluded to them already. Um, one is this, that confessions of faith undermine the sole authority of the Bible in matters of faith and practice. Confessions of faith undermine the sole authority of the Bible in matters of faith and practice. Which is, which is really interesting because that phrase is a confessional phrase. That the Bible is the sole authority in matters of faith and practice. That, that's it. That's a, that's a confessional phrase. And so people's argument against confessions is that confessions undermine a confessional phrase that they like. I don't like confessions, and I especially don't like confessions because they undermine a confessional phrase that I like. <clears throat> Again, the Bible is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. By, by the way, I agree with that. I agree with that. My confession also agrees with that. My confession starts with, the, the second London Baptist Confession, and most confessions start with defining what we mean by the Bible. Amen? Right? Because you can say this, the Bible is a final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Right? That's great. Good for you. Let's go to the book of Maccabees. Ah, uh, no, 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 no. We can't go to the book of Maccabees because the book of Maccabees is not, that's not Bible. Really? I can't, I can find my Catholic Bible is in the Catholic Bible. Yeah, but that's not, when I say Bible, I mean the, ah, but you can't do that. Because in order to do that, remember, you have to be what? Confessional. Confessional. Do you see, do you see how this works? This has you running around chasing your tail. Okay? The second argument. Confessions of faith are inconsistent with liberty of conscience before God. This is really important for, for Baptists, right? Liberty of conscience. My conscience cannot be bound by another. My conscience is only bound uh, by Scripture. Okay. And this is someone else binding my conscience. Um, let me say a couple of things. First, in order for this to technically be an issue, um, you would have to be forced to be a member of the church. So, for example, you can make this argument, and, and Baptists have made this argument, Baptists, we're not state church people. We, we believe that there is a, a separation, right? That's a very Baptist doctrine. Our other Reformed brethren are state church people. Okay? 
Um, so the, the Presbyterian Church was the Church of Scotland. Right? The Anglican Church was the Church of England. Uh, the Lutheran Church was a state church. All of these churches were state churches. Okay? Uh, all of them were state churches. Baptists were unique, not only because of our position on baptism, but because of our position on being a confessional free church and not a state church. Okay? Um, and so we, we would agree with this in that regard. But as Baptists, people volunteer to be members of our church. Amen? How can you accuse me of binding your conscience if you volunteered to be a member of the church where I told you what our confession was? Do you, do you see? Do you see how this doesn't, this doesn't work? Right? No. No, no, no. No confessions. Because we believe in the liberty of conscience. I have liberty of conscience before God. Absolutely, you have liberty of conscience before God. Which means that you are free to associate with whatever church you want to. But, riddle me this, bad man. In order for you to decide what church you're going to associate with, don't you kind of need to know what they believe? Or would you just walk down the street and go, I like this building? Right? Usually, we want to know what they believe. Right? What's the best way for you to know what they believe? For them to stand up and say, no creed but Christ. No confession but the Bible. You go, yeah, I'm home. <laughs> or for them to say, here is our confession. A nice, succinct statement of what we believe when we say Christ, and when we say Bible, and when we say sin, and when we say salvation, and when we say, right, here it is. The great irony is being confessional actually does the opposite. It does not violate liberty of conscience. It gives you the opportunity to exercise liberty of conscience by saying, here's who we are. And we want you to know that before you choose to associate with us. If your conscience won't allow you to associate with us, you're free to go and associate somewhere else. But we want you to know what we believe so that you can have that choice. Does, does that make sense? All right. What about arguments for? Arguments for, in light of what we talked about here. Number one, a confession is a useful means of public affirmation and defense of truth. It's a useful means of public affirmation and defense of truth. Okay? Um, we don't have to keep fighting for, for ground. We publicly affirm truth. We publicly defend truth. And then it's there. It remains for all to see. It, it publicly lets people know who we are and what we believe and where we stand. Secondly, uh, a confession serves as a public standard of fellowship and discipline. It serves as a public standard of fellowship and discipline. So you're, you're going to um, excommunicate someone for heresy, let's say. That someone, someone is espousing heresy. Let's say someone is teaching a, a class in the school or they have a home Bible study or something like that and they're teaching um, you know, some erroneous doctrine uh, about Christ. Let's say that they don't believe in the deity of Christ, and they're arguing against the deity of Christ. And you come to that person and you say, um, "You, you need to stop that, and you need to you need to correct that. This is 
This is erroneous doctrine, right? Um, a confession allows you in two ways. Number one, on the front end, a confession says, among other things, here's what we believe about Christ. So a person who doesn't believe in the deity of Christ is coming to join your church. Hopefully they've familiarized themselves with your confession. And they can say, you know what, actually, I disagree. I disagree with the chapter on Christ. Right? And you deal with that up front. Um, the other thing is, if they have signed on and they've joined, and then they persist in this heresy, now you have grounds for discipline. Because you've been clear. Right? But if you said, no creed but Christ, and they say, I agree with that. No confession but the Bible. And they say, I agree with that. And then they go cherry pick verses from the Bible in order to teach their heresy. Because this is what heretics do, right? Heretics generally don't go to other books. Sometimes they do. I, you know, the Mormons do this. Book of Mormon, Pearl of Great Price, right? They, 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 they go to other books to teach their heresy. But they also manipulate the Bible to teach their heresy as well. Um, and so generally the cults use the Bible. And the cults are very big on Jesus. Amen? What do the Mormons call themselves? The Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints. Ooh, that just sounds like something good, right? The Jehovah's Witnesses think very highly of Jesus. The Muslims think very highly of Jesus. Hmm? The Muslims think very highly of Jesus. In fact, some Muslims will argue they're the second largest religion in the world that teaches people to love Jesus. So again, without a confession, we come to this person and we say, you're teaching heresy. How can you say I'm teaching heresy? How can you discipline me for teaching heresy when I'm in agreement with what you required of me? No creed but Christ, no confession but the Bible. I'm teaching from the Bible. And I'm teaching on Christ from the Bible. Do, do you see? Do you see the problem here? Okay? So a confession serves as a public standard of fellowship and discipline. If you don't have a confession, then there has to be individual authority. Then the leadership has to decide what is important enough uh, to discipline and what is not. Okay? Thirdly, a confession serves as a concise standard by which to evaluate ministers of the word. A concise standard standard by which to evaluate ministers of the word. Okay? What what is what does Paul tell Titus? In Titus 1 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. Amen? So that he might exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. That is the biblical standard, right? But what does that mean? What does that mean? Creeds and confessions help us to be clear about that. This is what we mean. Okay? I, I, don't, I don't like what the preacher teaches. Coming to the pastor's office, Pastor, I just don't like it. I don't like that you're teaching this. Right? Okay, well, what, what I'm teaching this, and it is in accordance with our confession. You remember the confession that you agreed to when you became a member of the church? So the problem's not on this side of the desk. The problem's on that side of the desk. Do you, do you see how that, okay? Also within an eldership. How do we handle those kinds of disagreements and disputes within an eldership? Our confessions go a long way toward helping us to deal with that, right? I, I think so-and-so should be in the eldership. Okay, it's fine if you think that, but so and so does not hold to our confession. So it doesn't matter what a great guy you think he is, or even what a great teacher he may be. He may have incredible abilities as a teacher, right? 
But when you're in the ownership, you're representing the church in a doctrinal sense. You have to hold to what we hold to. Four. Confessions contribute to a sense of historic continuity. Historic continuity. And this is important. The idea that we didn't just invent this. We, we, didn't, just, we didn't just start this, right? We're, we're not the first ones. Um, and, and it is a very helpful thing. It's a very helpful thing because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. <clears throat> Amen? There's some very good work that's been done already. Let me just give you an, an idea. Um, first of all, let me skip over some of this. When we talk about historical continuity, the New Testament is not silent on this. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He didn't just say the Bible from right? He, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. In other words, he's talking about a body of doctrine. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 13 and 14. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Is he talking about the Bible as a whole? No. Pattern of sound words, right? These are, these are confessional statements. And then in chapter 3, verse 14, but that's for you. Continue in what you've learned and firmly believed. The idea here is that there is a standard. The idea here is that there is a pattern of sound words. That there is a confessional statement, a succinct confessional statement. Um, now, two main objections when we start talking about confessions um, that we deal with here, and I've heard these here. One is, you know, are these things biblical? Are these ideas biblical? And um, I, I think they are. We have succinct confessional statements in Scripture. But another thing that we deal with here. Um, <laughs> is, are these things African? Or are they just European? Anybody? I see some, I see some heads going like this, right? Yeah, yeah, all you confessional, but you know, Presbyterians, right? We're the Presbyterians, the Church of Scotland. I don't know if you're aware of this, but Scotland ain't exactly in North Africa. <laughs> long way away from here, right? Are you Baptist? That's great. But your confession is what? The second London Baptist confession, right? Uh, you, maybe, okay, we'll just go with the Christian Reformed Church. Oh, great. Now you've got the Belgic confession. So we go from Scotland to England to Belgium. Good for you. Well, let's, well we should be Lutheran then. Great. Germany. Let's just get all the colonial masters to tell us what to believe, right? I know you hear this, right? I've only been here for four years, and I'm tired of hearing it. <laughs> so I know you grow weary of this idea that this confessionalism is actually European, or more appropriately, it's, it's white, right? Um, it, okay, for the sake of time, we won't read, but we're, 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 we're familiar with of the Apostles' Creed, right? Um, we're familiar with the Nicene Creed, uh, and that's another one, you know? Yeah, Nicene Creed, Constantinople, Constantine, another white man. These guys who invented all of this stuff. Well, if you're at all familiar with the Nicene Creed, then you know that it is basically just an expansion of the Apostles' Creed, which is much older than Constantine or Constantinople, right? But how about this? This is from Tertullian. Who was Tertullian? Tertullian's one of the African church fathers. 
here's what amazes me. It amazes me how few Africans I meet know that there were African church fathers. Tertullian was one of the African church fathers. He's a Carthaginian. Second century early church father. He lived between 160 and 225. Listen to Tertullian in his piece on the prescription of heretics. Just listen to these phrases. Again, long before Constantine was thought of by anyone. Long before there was any Lutheran Presbytery, a Lutheran confession or Belgic confession or you know, any Scottish or, or, or London or Anglican, long before any of those things, over a thousand years before those things, listen to the early African church father to tell him. Now, with regard to this rule of faith, that, that rule of faith, the early, the early confession of faith, that we may from this point acknowledge what it is which we define. It is, you must know, that which prescribes the belief that there is one only God and that he is none other than the creator of the world. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Hmm? Same thing from Tertullian who produced all things out of nothing through his own word. First, first of all, he sent forth that this word is called his son, and under the name of God was seen in diverse manners by the patriarchs, heard at all times in the prophets, at last brought down by the spirit and power of the Father into the Virgin Mary, was made flesh in her womb, and being born of her, went forth as Jesus Christ. By the way, did you catch the idea there that Jesus is eternal Son of God? He is the Word who was placed in the womb and then went forth as Jesus Christ. Henceforth, he preached the new law and the new promise of the kingdom of heaven, worked miracles, having been crucified, he rose again on the third day. See, some people argue that the resurrection, that's this, that's this newfangled stuff. Then, having ascended into heaven, he sat at the right hand of the Father, sent instead of himself the power of the Holy Ghost to lead such as believe, will come with glory to take the saints to the enjoyment of everlasting life and of the heavenly promises, and to condemn the wicked to everlasting fire, after the resurrection of both these classes shall have happened together with the restoration of their flesh. The rule, as it will be proved, was taught by Christ and raised among ourselves no other questions than those which heresies introduce and which make men heretics. That's Tertullian. Second century African church father. Don't tell me that confessionalism is white or European. Amen, somebody. Amen. And we could talk about others like Athanasius, another early African church father. Okay? All right. So these historical confessions, we, we stand in a long line, not just of the biblical idea of confessions um, and also the early church idea of confessions, but we stand in the line of those reformed confessions. Um, I've talked about these early confessions. Remember, when we date the Reformation, um, the, we talk about uh, October 31st, 1517, right? The nailing of the 95 Theses in the door of the Wittenberg Church. Um, from there we get these, this line of reformed confessions and reform, and I would argue, and reforming confessions. The Augsburg Confession, that's Lutheranism, that's 1530. 
So again, 13 years after the nailing of the 95 Theses. The Belgian Confession, this is Christian Reformed Church, this is 1561. 39 Articles, 1563. The Canons of the Synod of Dort, also the CRC, 1618. Um, then we get the first London Baptist Confession, 1644. The Westminster Confession of Faith, this is the Church of Scotland, that's 1646. Um, then we get the Savoy Declaration of Faith. Um, this was in 1685. These are the Congregational Puritans, John Owen and the like. And then the second London Baptist Confession of 1689. Okay? So the, the, the faith that we confess is a historic faith that connects us to those who have held to these truths throughout history and found them rooted and grounded in Scripture. This is not something that we just made up. This is a tradition that we are a part of. All right. Um, I'm going to stop here.